everyone. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy this talk. I know I am, definitely. Uh, so Cody Clements is currently a research scientist at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, USA, and has spent over a decade conducting research in French Polynesia, Fiji, and other locales throughout the Pacific. His research interests focus on understanding how coral reef ecosystems are structured and function in a rapidly changing ocean, as well as integrating these insights into conservation strategies that can promote ecosystem health and the systems they provide for coastal communities. So over to you, Cody. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, want to say thank you all for being here today. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Cody Clements. I'm a research scientist in the School of Biological Sciences at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia in the U.S. And today I'm going to be talking about sea cucumbers, their importance to coral reef ecosystems, and what their large-scale removal during the past decades to centuries might mean for coral health and the function of tropical reef ecosystems. So in the very likely case that you don't know who I am, uh, I figured I'd just give a little background about myself. It's probably obvious from my accent that I'm American. I come from the Southeastern US, the state of Tennessee, not too far from the Great Smoky Mountains. So a landlocked state, not anywhere particularly close to the ocean, uh, but when I was a teenager, I decided to move abroad to study coral reef ecology and ended up pursuing a degree in marine science at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. And after completing my bachelor's, I decided to stay and complete a master's and was living in a village on the southwest coast of the main island. And at the time, I was contemplating my future. Some of my friends asked me, you know, what do you want to do after this? And as a semi-aimless 23-year-old, uh, I replied, I don't know. I think I want to do a PhD. And they instantly replied, oh, there's a scientist here recently from a place called Georgia Tech. Uh, we told him about you. You should contact him. And I was like, what? That's two hours from where I was born. But anyway, the rest is history. I ended up coming to Georgia Tech to complete my PhD and stayed on as a postdoc. And now I'm a senior research scientist. And I continue to conduct research in locations around the world, but most of my efforts are currently focused in the Pacific Islands and specifically in French Polynesia. Now, enough about me, uh, back to the sea cucumbers. Since this presentation is for the Linnaean Society, I thought we'd first start off with a little basic taxonomic overview. Sea cucumbers are members of the phylum Echinodermata, which includes sea stars, sea urchins, crinoids, et cetera, and are further classified as holothurians. And there are more than 1,700 known species of sea cucumbers, and they inhabit virtually every marine environment on Earth, from shallow intertidal depths, or shallow, from the shallow intertidal to depths greater than 10,000 meters. So they've been found even down in the Mariana Trench. And they often comprise a significant proportion of the animal biomass on the ocean floor. Now, ecologically, sea cucumbers are classified as detritivores. And just in case anyone is unfamiliar with this term, as the name suggests, detritivores are organisms that feed on detritus. But what does that mean? Well, this essentially means they are the animal equivalent of compost disposal. Uh, feeding on and helping to break down decaying organic matter. Many animals you might be familiar with, such as crabs, earthworms, snails, etc., are detritivores and are very important for helping to promote decomposition and foster the recycling of nutrients within ecosystems. Now, despite their assumed and known ecological importance, relatively little is known about how detritivore loss threatens ecosystem function, especially when compared to top-level consumers. So the loss of top-level consumers is often seen as a defining feature of this period that we live in of unprecedented in human influence, sometimes referred to as the Anthropocene. And the dramatic effects of removing top consumers have been documented across many ecosystems. I've just included some examples here that you might be familiar with, such as sea otters and kelp forests, uh, the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, large fishes in lakes and on coral reefs, et cetera. Uh, and that said, less is known about the effects of removing consumers from lower trophic levels, such as detritivores, despite their likely importance and that they too are increasingly being threatened by humans. 
That said, there are some things that we do know. This is particularly true for the detritivores I study and that are the focus of this talk, sea cucumbers. I hope this video is playing, but uh, it looks a little choppy on my screen, but sea cucumbers help to filter and clean sediments as they feed on bacteria, microalgae, and other organic matter in the sand. This is why we sometimes refer to them, as the title of this talk suggests, as the janitors of the sea. They are clearly playing a role in the processing of sediments and likely are integral for maintenance of sediment health, nutrient dynamics, and other key ecosystem functions. And because I conduct most of my research on tropical reefs, I often refer to them as the Roombas of the reef for this reason. So they're like little mobile vacuum cleaners sucking up all of the detritus and organics helping to keep the reef clean. Now, just for some perspective on some things that we do know, we know that sea cucumbers are capable of processing a lot of sediment, a lot. Some species can process up to 80 kilograms of sediment per individual per year. Now, this figure I've included here is an example from the findings of Williamson et al, where they estimated sediment processing rates of sea cucumbers on Heron Island on Australia's Great Barrier Reef. They found that densities of less than 0.2 individuals per meter square equated to 64,000 tons of sea cucumber poop per year, or approximately the mass of five Eiffel Towers. And that's just on the reef surrounding this one small island. These numbers are incredible when you consider that some historical accounts from the early 20th century reported densities exceeding 50 individuals per meter square in some remote locations. So just think about this in relation to the densities reported in the previous slide, less than 0.2 individuals per meter square, and the tremendous amounts of sediment that they were still capable of collectively processing at these lower densities. But the sad fact is that we probably don't even truly grasp what we're missing here. Sea cucumbers have been over harvested for decades to centuries, and this is only ramped up since the late 1900s. Now, I just felt like including this video in here, uh, hopefully it plays. I was recently at the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco and was looking around their coral reef exhibit. Sea cucumbers were present and cleaning up the sediment throughout their tanks, and it just got me thinking that it seems pretty intuitive that you need the cleaning crew to keep things sanitary, but it's largely just assumed. There hasn't been much in the way of actually experimentally testing this in the wild. And if you've ever had a simple fish tank, you're probably familiar with what happens if you don't have these lowly bottom feeders. It can get nasty pretty quick. And this is also likely true for adequately maintaining natural ecosystems in the wild. And so this begs the question, how has the large scale removal of these once abundant, once abundant consumers from the wild affected what I call fishbowl earth? So we know there are effects at something the scale of a fishbowl. So what about if we scale that up to the entire planet? Well, let's start by considering the state of coral reefs around the globe, which in all honesty is uh, pretty grim. I've just included some numbers here from regions around the world, such as the Caribbean, where average coral, ha coral cover has declined approximately 80% since 1970. On Australia's Great Barrier Reef, the story is not necessarily as bad, but it's still nothing to sigh a breath of relief about. Coral cover here has declined by approximately 50% from 1985 to 2012 and continues to be under threat. While these declines have been attributed to a combination of global and local stressors, disease has been one of the dominant drivers of coral decline. 
Now, we know that diseases are ravaging corals on reefs worldwide, but increasing evidence also suggests that at least some of these diseases are being vectored to corals from the sediment. And this further begs the question, could a loss of critical waste management from detritivores, such as the lowly sea cucumber, be contributing to this problem? So we set out to test this experimentally in the wild, but before getting into the experiments, I just wanted to give you a little background on the state of sea cucumbers where we conduct most of our work in French Polynesia. Now, the first recorded harvest of sea cucumbers for export in French Polynesia was 1810, so that's nearly 215 years ago. And the first quantities reported for export were in 1931 at 60,000 kilograms. Export quantities were reported sporadically for the next 77 years until 2008 when exports ramped up massively to cater to the market in Asia, which is the main destination for sea cucumbers harvested worldwide. And exports ended up peaking at 120,000 kilograms in 2011, at which, point vir at which point virtually all commercially valuable species have been completely depleted from French Polynesian reefs. This resulted in a nationwide moratorium the next year that remains in place to this day. However, despite wiping out many of these stocks, some less desirable species remain. There are still some locations where testing this notion in the wild is feasible, and we still see fairly high densities, as many as 23 individuals per meter square, of sea cucumbers on some reefs where we work in French Polynesia, which you can see in this drone video on this slide. And in this case, these are almost exclusively the species Holothuria atra, which is one of the few species that is generally undesirable for eating and which explains why it is still prevalent. And just a little more background here. The impetus for pursuing this line of research actually originated from a series of unrelated experiments where we observed coral outplants dying from the base up when in contact with sediments in areas where we had just so happened to clear sea cucumbers for other experiments. And the coral species we observed this occurring for is a species of the genus Acropora, in this case, Acropora pulchra specifically. Now, this is important because acroporid corals are among the most important reef building coral species on tropical reefs. And as luck would have it, they're also among the most threatened. Now, as I mentioned, disease, the disease we've observed on our corals is reminiscent of Caribbean white band disease. This disease has been involved in the unprecedented decline of Caribbean acropora corals. There are two species of acropora in the Caribbean, a, Acropora cervicornis, which is pictured here in this slide, and Acropora palmata. At one time, these two species were the most abundant and dominant reef building corals in the Caribbean. However, outbreaks of white band disease in the late 1970s and 1980s killed over 80% of their populations, and both corals are now listed as critically endangered. That's why our observations were so intriguing and why we were so keen to investigate further. And so we decided to test this notion using a relatively simple series of manipulative experiments. We first collected and outplanted Acropora pulchra in natural sand patches in the field where we either regularly removed or didn't remove sea cucumbers. Uh, and then we just monitored the corals for 45 days to see what would happen. And we found that corals experienced approximately 370% greater tissue mortality when sea cucumbers were removed, and that the risk of whole colony death was reduced by 94% when sea cucumbers were present. Next, we wanted to test this notion in another location. We wanted to test it with a different species of sea cucumber and a different species of coral to see how general these findings might be. Is this a common effect that occurs? And so we decided to conduct a simul similar manipulative experiment 3000 kilometers away on Palmyra Atoll. Now this remote atoll has no permanent human population, unlike Moorea where we've conducted our other experiments, but it does have a research station where scientists can conduct research and it's managed by the Nature Conservancy and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. 
So we're getting different species, a different kind of island, a different amount of human influence. However, the lagoon on Palmyra Atoll was heavily damaged by U.S. military activities during World War II. Um, but it does have some coral starting to recolonize in some areas. So for our experiments, we decide to use a different species of Acropora, in this case, Acropora nasuda, and a different species of sea cucumber that's common within Palmyra's lagoons, in this case, Stichopus chlorinotus. And we found that coral mortality was significantly reduced when corals were not directly contacting the sediment or when sea cucumbers were present. So if they were touching the sediment and they didn't have sea cucumbers present, it's bad. But if you add the sea cucumbers into their enclosure, they are helping to clean the sand and the corals survive better. And we've also run subsequent experiments in French Polynesia, again, on the island where we work mostly, Moldrea, uh, to try to determine whether and to which extent microbial pathogens might be contributing to the coral disease that we're observing. So in experiments where we caged corals with versus without sea cucumbers, we found that sea cucumber absence again led to greater coral mortality, as well as altered the microbiome of the sand and enrich sediments and corals with microbial taxa that have been associated with coral stress and disease, including white band disease and other diseases hypothesized to derive from sediments. And you can see from the video um, how dramatically the substrate changed when sea cucumbers were absent. You can see this layer of greenish gook, uh, as well as the corals exhibiting this characteristic white band of death that travels from the base of the colony up. That said, we don't know whether these microbes are the causative agents of disease or they're just opportunists taking advantage of it. But this is something that we're actively investigating. And we're currently trying to narrow down the potential pathogen or pathogens involved. This, this turns out to be a lot harder than you might think. We're kind of on the cutting edge of ignorance. Um, but we have found evidence for disease suppression when corals are administered to broad spectrum antibiotics. So in this case, gentamicin and ampicillin, which coincidentally were also able to suppress white band disease in Caribbean corals. Uh, that said, this is still a work in progress. So make sure to stay tuned on that one. And finally, we're pairing these insights with other processes that are playing out on reefs to determine how sea cucumber presence or absence interacts with common stressors to affect coral well-being. So, for example, coral cover has declined and seaweed cover has increased on many reefs around the world, including many of those found within the lagoons of Morea. And seaweeds often compete with and can harm corals via a number of mechanisms, including stimulation of microbes that can harm corals. Um, now in Morea, we often see the formation of these seaweed rafts. So these rafts uh, often form due to seaweed breaking off due to natural processes such as storms, swells, or natural senescence. The seaweed tends to accumulate into these rafts and float across the reefs within the lagoon, raining down algae onto the reef bottom. Now, while conducting our work, we often observe that these rafts drift into and pile up near shore on the fringing reefs where we conduct many of our experiments. This seaweed then falls down and begins to decompose on the reef bottom. We also notice in our general observations that sea cucumber densities just so happen to be considerably greater near shore and decrease as you move away from shore. So given these observations, we decided to properly quantify these differences and investigate the potential ecological implications of these differences. So we first quantified algal deposition in natural sand patches across our study reef and found that algal deposition is indeed greater closer to shore. And this is interesting because as expected, we also observed that sea cucumber densities increase dramatically the closer you get to shore. Furthermore, when sea cucumbers are present, levels of organics within the sediments don't differ between these different areas that are more or less distant from shore. 
However, when sea cucumbers are experimentally removed from these same sand patches, we found that sediment organics actually increase closer to shore. And this makes sense. If you're missing your reef Roombas, you would expect organics to increase due to greater seaweed deposition. And we also found that corals naturally occurring in all of these areas actually experience greater mortality the closer they are outplanted to shore. And this too makes sense. If sea cucumbers are cleaning up the nasty stuff that's accumulating in the sand, their absence would be more felt in areas where there are more nasty things that are accumulating. And finally, um, using manipulative feeding choice experiments, we found that sea cucumbers do indeed prefer to feed in areas where sea cucumber has been rotting on the sediment. And this is further corroborated by evidence from aquacultural studies conducted in Asia, where sea cucumbers are in fact often fed diced up seaweed as feed, including seaweeds that are commonly found in the seaweed rafts of Morea. Thus, the evidence is suggesting that sea cucumbers may help reduce detrital loads and potentially abundances of harmful microbes and could promote coral well-being in these increasingly degraded reef ecosystems. And so taken together, our findings are suggesting that removal of lower level consumers, such as sea cucumbers, may play a considerable underappreciated role in coral health and well-being. And this ecological fuse, as we like to call it, was likely lit decades ago and may only now be contributing to our current predicament. And with the growing number of threats facing coral reefs, the janitors of the sea may be needed now more than ever. And so with that, I would just like to say maruru, merci, and thank you to all the funding agencies and regulatory agencies that have helped make this work possible as well as my collaborators and colleagues that <laughs> helped me fling sea cucumbers out of sand patches in the field. And thanks again to all of you for your time and attention. Thanks so much, Cody, that was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. So first off from Ellen, uh, we have other than humans, what else eats sea cucumbers? Uh, that is a very interesting question. Uh, we, in many ways, don't know. It, it depends on the species. Many sea cucumbers are, have highly toxic properties, essentially. Uh, you know, I would say there are probably some species of fish and potentially octopus, things of that nature, but we in, in the case of where we work in Moorea, we don't find any clear predators of the sea cucumbers that we work with. We've actually, that was one of the hypotheses we tried to exclude we, of why they might be more abundant near shore. We said, oh, maybe their predators are further out. So we took some out deeper, closer to the reef crest and dropped them out there and monitored what would happen to them. Nothing seems to prey upon them. Um, it is also possible that whatever did used to prey on them, it has been depleted drastically. So I'll give an example. We have a coral predator that is in the Pacific called the crown of thorn sea star. They are a big problem. They used to have a very common predator, the Triton trumpet, which is the Pacific conch. Mm -hmm. uh, and those have virtually been wiped out from most Pacific reefs. So their main predator, at least when they're adults, doesn't really exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's what's caused their numbers to just explode in many ways because nothing is regulating their populations. So, yeah, like I said, it depends. Some sea cucumbers clearly probably have predators. They, uh, we have another species that you only see it at night and mm -hmm. it comes out of the reef during the night. So, yeah. Um, cool. The answer is it depends and we don't know a lot about it. So. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing how much we don't know. The, the more I delve into the literature on sea cucumbers, the more I'm like, wow. I guess it doesn't help that they're not traditionally charismatic. Yeah, exa <laughs> exactly. They're <laughs> they're not everyone's favorite animal. <laughs> Justice for sea cucumbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they are. 
the fact that humans do like to eat them, they're not exactly hard to catch. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. So Andrew asks, what is the effect of the sea cucumber poop on the environment? Does it not affect the corals or are they actually a cleanser and how so? Yeah, so um, this is something that we are studying right now. We actually have uh, been doing metagenomic analyses on the sand uh, before sea cucumbers are eating it as it's passing through their gut and then what comes out on the other side. Um, we're finding that when sea cucumbers consume sand, they are depleting the sand of bacteria quite a bit, like decreasing bacterial load particularly of cyanobacteria taxa. So mm -hmm. um, when it comes out on the other end, there's actually some hypotheses that uh, the excrement of sea cucumbers could actually boost coral growth and productivity because they're releasing certain types of nitrogen and things of that nature that help corals grow. Uh, mm -hmm. There is evidence that fish, fish pee can help corals grow. So that is again something we don't know it is a hypothesis that was recently proposed in a review paper and we're actually planning to test that this november so i'm going to plant corals uh in areas and i'm going to either include sea cucumbers or not and then we're going to track their growth over time to see if not only does it improve survivorship but also improve growth cool yeah. uh, alan asks what is their lifespan uh, that as well differs <laughs> by species, but, uh, yeah, we actually get asked this by, uh, the regulatory agencies in French Polynesia, how old are the sea cucumbers? And well, you know, uh, I would say they're most of them. It's probably on this or the ones we work with, at least it's probably on the scale of decades, maybe a mm -hmm. decade or two, but yeah, again, we don't really know, but you know, there are 1700 species, so it, it really depends. They come in different shapes and sizes. The one we work with is about this big. There are some on the reef, uh, like the pineapple sea cucumber. You rarely see them in Mo'orea where we work anymore, but they can be really big. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I would assume that uh, some of these larger bodied ones probably live for a long time, maybe decades. Okay, cool. And yeah. that was a great answer because we had a few people asking about how many species there were. So sorted. Uh, <laughs> So Alice asks, as well as over harvesting from humans, have they been affected by other things like microplastics or rising sea temperatures? Um, if they have been affected by microplastics or rising sea cucumber, uh, rising temperatures, no one has documented it. Uh, the only things I know of, which we are also planning to do some experiments on, it's opening up a whole area of research. Is I know they've been used as or people have tried to use them as bioindicators of heavy metal toxins. Mm -hmm. So there are some studies that have been done in Southeast Asia where they sampled sea cucumber tissue and they found that um, heavy metal toxins were elevated in their tissues, for example, near areas close to where mining discharge was being put out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we are actually wanting to test... Um, whether they accumulate specifically toxins like arsenic, because these seaweed rafts that I was talking about, these are a big problem in the Caribbean uh, because you have big rafts of a particular type of seaweed called sargassum that are washing into beach areas mm -hmm. uh, all throughout the Caribbean. And people, you would think, oh, like collect it and use it as fertilizer, but it's very high in arsenic. So you can't use it in agriculture really. So we want to see if the sea cucumbers can actually help remediate the deposition of arsenic, uh, potentially by sequestering it into their bodies. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it might be good for the environment, not so good for a human if they're wanting to consume them to eat, but. Cool. I heard a similar thing with mussels in the UK, like, cause they filter microplastics, but then, uh, obviously that's not something muscle farmers want to be. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would, I would put money on it that they are accumulating microplastics. I mean, especially. <laughs> on the reefs where we work even on the island i told i was i was mentioning palmyra atoll it's one of the most remote islands we have plastic bottles on one of the beaches exposed to heavy swell that are, the beach is just littered with toothbrushes and water bottles that have wrapping 
from Taiwan or mm -hmm. Japan, like things traveling across the entire Pacific and are washing up there in like huge numbers. So mm -hmm. no place is safe from yeah. uh, plastic yeah. waste. And Max says, please tell us about sea cucumbers reproductive cycle. Oh, well, that's also interesting. Um, sea cucumbers can reproduce sexually. Uh, they can also reproduce, well, at least the species I work with, can also reproduce asexually just by budding. So they can just go bloop, and uh, break into two individuals. Um, yeah, so you have, you'll have mass spawning events. I, for example, years ago, before I really worked on sea cucumbers, I was on the Great Barrier Reef. I was on Heron Island, the island I mentioned. And they had a, co a collection tank where tourists could come and look at the animals that were inside the tank. Mm -hmm. And the tank had a, an inlet from the ocean that's feeding it with seawater. And one evening, the three sea cucumbers that were in the tank, they just bolt over to where the flow of water is coming in and stand up like a cobra and start releasing sperm. And then they would do that for about 30 seconds, then they would lay down and then they would get, could come back up again. They did this for about 30 minutes. So they were clearly sensing chem probably chemically something in the water that's telling them it's time to mm -hmm. throw our sperm into the water column and reproduce. And like many marine organisms, I would say once the sperm and eggs meet, they spend some time in the plankton and then they decide to settle somewhere on a reef somewhere potentially their resident the reef they came from that is still an area of active research we're finding that larvae can smell their home reef and all kinds of crazy things but in many cases they can drift on the currents and find a new home cool uh helen asks, do you think that the different species of sea cucumbers are able to clean and remove different microbes in the sediment yeah, that, so that's a, that is something we're very, very interested in because, you know, there are, there are approximately 20 species of sea cucumber that are known in French, the lagoons of French Polynesia. We're working with one species. And so my research besides sea cucumbers has mainly focused on coral biodiversity and how the biodiversity of corals impacts coral reef communities. So I'm kind of like a glorified coral gardener. I plant corals in mixed species communities or single species and look at how it affects their performance. And as with many situations, biodiversity actually promotes coral growth, like mm -hmm. more species together do, do better. And I would assume that you get a similar effect with sea cucumbers because you would have complementarity among species that are exploiting different parts of the sediment, cleaning different aspects of the sediment. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we have actually found that on the reefs where we work, there is another species of sea cucumber that only comes out at night and comes out in very high densities. So we were trying to design experiments where we can test with them and potentially one other species that we find. It's really hard because all of them have been depleted so badly. But we want to run some experiments in enclosures where we have multiple species present mm -hmm. or only a single species and see how it affects the sediment microbial communities, as well as how it affects coral survival and the micro the microbiome of corals, et cetera. But yeah, this is an area we're super interested in. Cool. Uh, Ken wants to know, do they eat live seaweed as well? And would they graze on species like seagrass? Uh, they to my knowledge they do not eat well it also yeah it depends on the species but the ones i work with and the ones i'm familiar with uh they do they basically only filter sediments they're eating microalgae that's within the sediment um but in terms of just going up like an herbivore and chewing on seagrass and on seaweed not really so um the studies i mentioned the aquaculture studies they dice the seaweed up for juvenile sea cucumbers to very, very, very small. It's like essentially almost like a powder form and then spread it in the cage on, on the substrate. And that's how they, that's how they feed. So yeah, I'm not familiar with any of them going up and just explicitly eating mm -hmm. a, a frond. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, so then there's a few questions from Helen, Guy and Sandra. It was all about like, can they be farmed? Why do people eat them? Uh, do they taste good? Any claimed health benefits? 
Um, yeah, so they can be farmed. Sea cucumber aquaculture is a is a big and increasingly big thing in Asia and in the Caribbean. Um, I mean, we want to actually promote that if possible to so that we're not taking wild ones out of the ocean that, you know, we want their populations to be sustainable at some level. Um, yes, they can be eaten. They are a delicacy in China. It's kind of like shark fin is a delicacy over there. Um, they are purported to have medicinal and other properties. Like I think some of them are used as aphrodisiac. Um, so yeah, I've actually had sea cucumber. I had it about, I think 10 or 12 years ago in Fiji because technically there is like a, a restaurant that I went to with some of my friends that is traditional Fijian food. You don't really see sea cucumber as something people eat these days, but it was on the it was on the menu. So I just said, oh, okay, I'm just going to try it. Uh, can't say that it was my favorite thing I've ever eaten. It was kind of like a soggy, squishy bread, essentially. So I, I don't see the appeal, but, you know, there are species that uh, go for unbelievable prices, like the ones that are, I'll, I'll give you an example. I've been trying to do work in the florida keys and so i realized wow we don't really know anything about sea cucumbers in the florida keys and then i just discovered through newspaper clippings uh that there was a, an individual about 10 years ago who was trying to start a business to export sea cucumbers to asia and the plan and it was a feasible plan he was pushing back against regulation that they were thinking of implementing it was selling them for over 200 dollars a pound so, yeah, and in certain sea cucumbers, like there's a sea cucumber that's highly prized from Japan, they can go for over $1,300 US dollars per kilogram. So, <laughs> yeah, this is like biological gold. Yeah. In some ways. And I imagine like just, it's really difficult then to stop the trade unless you offer the people who are fishing for them something that is yeah. going to be, if not equivalent, at least close enough but yeah. they're not being screwed over either. Yeah, there are a lot of study a lot of studies that have looked at the the seaweed or sea cucumber trade in Mexico and other parts of Latin America and it even the cartels are involved in it. And and it's just crazy because local fishermen are only getting like a dollar mm -hmm. per kilogram, less than that realistically, but they're they are desperate to have a form of income. So, you know, telling them they can't go fish this is really hard on the, by the time it gets through the middleman on the back end, they're making loads of money on it, but there are many places that are already like the, the populations have collapsed. Yeah. And it happens very quickly. Like as soon as they've identified an area, you know, it's got probably less than 10 years before it's, mm -hmm. it's wiped out. Sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as with many things in <laughs> the ocean world it can be depressing but <laughs> yeah. I mean, i'm gonna do a phd on sharks and uh so yeah yeah <laughs> oh god <laughs> so keep, keep, have... keep keep fighting the good fight yeah like please guys <laughs> Please stop. That's, that's, why I, that's why I'm trying to bring a little notoriety to them. Actually, uh, National <laughs> Public Radio NPR in the U.S. did an interview with me for All Things Considered. It's like one of the main podcasts for NPR. And they put it on their Instagram. And the number of comments from just common people that were like, wow, the world's going to going to hell. But sea cucumbers rock. And like, <laughs> you know, getting them a little publicity, they need it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there we're doing our bit yeah <laughs> um so julianne asked could they be compared to the earthworm i guess that's in terms of their ecological function and, and importance yeah absolutely they that they often are compared to earthworms so uh, they play a, a similar role and they also uh you know aerate sediments they help mix sediment up to you know bring up different layers that are being su suppressed under the mm -hmm. surface essentially and some species don't live on the surface like Holothuria atra, the one I work with. Some of them just stay bur burrowed in the sand, and you might see them periodically, but they're they're basically going through the sand like an earthworm does through dirt. 
Cool. Yeah. And then finally, we have Annabelle who asks, in terms of coral health, is it possible to estimate the relative effects of reducing cucumber density and ocean warming? Oh, boy. Um, is it possible? I Yeah, I think it, it might be possible with sufficient funds and uh, human work power. But uh, we've still got a long way to go. We've basically just opened open Pandora's box on this. And, um, you know, there are some places like where we work that we can test this with a single species, but I think it's going to be very hard to turn back the clock to understand just, you know, how important the, the, I mean, it's the equivalent of going out into the great plains of the U U S and being like, huh, how does this ecosystem work when 200 years ago, there were millions of mm -hmm. upon millions of bison roaming the great plains and now they're all gone. It's a fundamentally altered ecosystem and trying to really recapture, well, what, how what would happen with bison if they were still here it's it's possible i guess in to mentally simulate it but in terms of experimentally showing it, it it's a lot more difficult yeah uh and then i just want to ask like i've seen sea cucumbers diving and snorkeling like around the uk and ireland do you think these results could be applicable to temperate and say deep sea ecosystems i mean yeah i i i would put I, I would put money on it probably that just like in coral reefs how they are helping to maintain important functions within coral reefs that they are also carrying out important functions in these other ecosystems in terms of recycling new helping to recycle nutrients and keep sediment health proper i mean we coral reefs aren't the only places facing uh, issues with disease i mean seagrass there are issues with diseases among seagrass in temperate um ecosystems, not just, uh, you know, things of that nature, like sea star wasting disease. I don't know if they're particularly linked to that, but we're basically just, we're seeing the rise of marine diseases mm -hmm. that are decimating all kinds of organisms, not just corals. I mean, one of the biggest die-offs, disease-related die-offs in history that we are aware of is the die-off of the diadema sea urchin in the carib in the caribbean mm -hmm. so you know in the same time period when these two species of acropora corals that i mentioned were being wiped out across the caribbean uh the main herbivore of caribbean reefs the sea urchin was also being decimated and over 90 percent of them died off within you know less than a 15 year period yeah and they haven't fully recovered and that's a huge deal because we need these herbivores on coral reefs to help keep the seaweed in check so mm -hmm. you know, so it all kind of works together but yes i do think that they would probably play an important role uh, in other ecosystems okay amazing uh i really enjoyed that uh <laughs> i think from the questions everyone else did as well we have trevor said it was very insightful um and he loved the presentation uh i mean for me selfishly this is my last day working at the Linnaean society so couldn't have thought of a better lunchtime lecture to go out with um so thanks very much thanks to everyone who logged on uh, make sure to sign up to our newsletter, check out the YouTube channel, all the links I put into the chat. And I won't. Someone else will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you.